Working? You're muted. Yep, they uh, they moved the mute button on me again, and I almost hung up on the call. Yes, I have almost <laughs> done that too. <laughs> it was like, oh, wrong orange button. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the shiny orange button must click all orange buttons. <laughs> no. No, don't don't do it. Don't do it. That just shuts it down. Especially when I I have I have I haven't done it yet, but I've almost shut down the broadcast yeah. on many occasions because it's just I don't know what it is. They're completely different buttons, but the red color just makes me it just draws click me it. in. Yeah. Okay. Did you see Day of the Doctor yet? No. no? Shush. Spoilers. Okay. No. Right. Well, no. Anyway. No. Going. To why that. isn't there Why isn't there a big red button? I was. Why is it listing me as a different human being? Okay, let me fix that. Um. Yeah, I'm going tonight with Nicole Gallucci at Noisy Astronomer. We're going to go see it in the theater with both of our significant others. Good. Whoa, I have sound coming from somewhere. You, you have another window somewhere. Open up. There, killed it. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, it's great. <clears throat> I really enjoyed it, actually. It was, uh, cool. it was both sort of... Uh, Fan service. Spoilers. <clears throat> I'm not spoiling anything. It was entertaining. It was it was good. John Hurt was great. It was a good show. Um, and they it was like a world record for the most countries simultaneously broadcasting it, like 94 yeah. countries. So yeah. So we're gonna go. I think we're seeing it in either 3D or IMAX tonight. Good. That'd be great. <laughs> Do that. But you're back from Indonesia. I, I am, and, and the reason I didn't see Doctor Who is because I've been in transit. It took me uh, 44 hours to get from the conference I was at in Bangdong, Indonesia, all the way back to St. Louis, America, or the United States. Um, so it was a kind of long journey, over 24 hours of flight time. But I highly recommend Indonesia for everything except for crossing the street. That was terrifying. The um, driving's pretty mad there. As near as I can tell, there's only vague road rules, and motorcycles don't count because they'll be on both sides of the street going any direction they feel like at any velocity. They feel like sometimes with upwards of five people on one moped. <laughs> there are no rules. Yeah, I've, I've seen like camera views <clears throat> of people walking in streets in Indonesia and India and places like that. It just looks terrifying. I'm, yes. But I mean, yes. Yeah, and people get hurt all the time. But uh we didn't and the food is absolutely amazing. The people are incredibly friendly. If there is a place to plant a plant, they have planted a plant there. It's the greenest place I've been in my life. And other than the fact that I got sunburned for like the first time in years, um I didn't think I could be sunburned that easily. Um, but equatorial country and all that, yeah, it was amazing. Oh, that's great. And but did you get work done? Yes, and there is going to be hours and hours and hours of uh, conference video getting posted. And I, I actually, I got to talk to someone who does uh, numerical modeling of orbits, and I, I got software that I need to figure out to finally solve one of the problems I've been wanting to solve. There's uh, I don't remember if it's a Jules Verne or an H.G. Wells. I'm pretty sure it's a Jules Verne story about a star plunging through uh, the solar system and how it disrupts all of the planets. And I've always wanted to run a numerical model to see what mass star would be required to do that. And I found the code, or I found someone who has the code. So I'm going to be working on uh, doing that research project in my spare time. Great. Someone should whip that up in the Kerbal Space Program. <laughs> Send a mission to this <laughs> horrible solar system. Um, cool. Okay, so if people have no idea what's going on here, we're going to be recording a live episode of Astronomy Cast. This is our weekly podcast about space and astronomy. Uh, Pamela's got the brain. I ask the questions. Um, Pamela has the jet lag, so it might be more amusing than normal. If you're watching this live, you know what you're in for, which is, uh, sorry, Preston, can we ask that one again? Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is going to be episode 323 on isotopes, and we'll take about 25 minutes or so to actually record the episode, and then we'll stick around. I'm not sure how much energy you have to answer people's questions. We'll ask if you can answer a couple of questions. I will. Yeah, that should be fine. I, I'm unfortunately down to half a cup of coffee already, but we'll see Yikes. what we can do. Oh no, make it last. Um, 
Cool. Okay. Are you uh, are you ready to record? Yeah, I think so. Okay, let me get my info in front of me. And I'm ready to press record. I do record not you like are. where the hang-up button is. Okay, <clears throat> I am pressing record, and it's recording. Okay. I'm also recording. Are you in mono? Yes. Right on. Okay, here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 323, Isotopes. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good, and you're back from your epic uh, Indonesian adventure. I am. Last week I was at the Southeast Asian Young Astronomers Conference where uh, I gave a workshop that I'm going to be blogging about on CosmoQuest and I gave a talk about CosmoQuest. Um, yeah, it was amazing. It was, I think, the first conference I've been to in my life where uh, the number of contributed talks by women was the same, if not more, than the number by men. Uh, invited speakers were equal numbers. Uh, the food was amazing. I, mm. I gained a kilogram while I was there. Um, yeah, it was it was in every way. The science was great. The camaraderie was great. Um, the spiders were the biggest spiders I've ever seen. I saw your pictures on Google Plus. <laughs> this is terrifying. You had your hand next to the spider, and they were the same size. Yes, yes. It was a huge spider. It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I, I highly recommend Indonesia, and I think I'm going to be attempting to convince my husband it's worth going there for vacation at some point. Oh, that sounds great. Um, so one thing that maybe we want to get people's help doing, if you're listening to this and you subscribe to us through iTunes, uh, if you could take a second and give us a review on iTunes, that would be terrific. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, let other people know what you think of the show and so they can find it and uh, and decide whether they should subscribe as well. So the uh, best place to do that is in iTunes. You can just do a search for Astronomy Cast, and then there's reviews, and you can rate the show and, and give us a review, and we really appreciate that. That's uh, super helpful. Uh, okay, well, let's get on with the show then. So the number of protons defines an element, but the number of neutrons can vary. We call these different flavors of an element isotopes and use these isotopes to solve some challenging mysteries in physics and astronomy. Some isotopes occur naturally, and others need to be made in nuclear reactors and particle accelerators. Uh, okay, Pamela, so let's, I guess we need to have that kind of basic chemistry physics lesson uh, about the atom, <laughs> what's inside the atom. So, so uh, let's go with that basic sort of building block of the atom, and then we'll get into the isotopes. So you basically have three different particles that uh, make up an atom. You have the electrons, which are inconsequential for the discussion today. They orbit in a cloud, not in nice, neat orbits like planets, but in a cloud around the atomic nuclei. The nu nuclei itself is made up of protons that desperately want to repel each other via the electromagnetic force, but are held together with the strong force, um, and buffering them is uh, a set, in many cases, of neutrons, and those neutrons uh, the whole thing is held together, again, via the strong force. And if you really care, the particle that is uh, conducting this force is the gluon. And I just love the fact that nuclei are glued together with Best gluons. Best name ever. Yes. <laughs> yeah. OK, so we've got the protons, the neutrons, the electrons. Forget about the electrons. We don't care about them. Protons, right. that's the number which gives us the, I guess, Atom. it's the atomic number, right? Yes. And then you take the number of the uh, of the protons and the number of the neutrons, and that specifies which isotope you're dealing with. And uh, each per particular isotope is referred to as a nucleotide. So okay. Uh, one now, atom has many isotopes. Each individual isotope is a nucleotide. Okay. Now, <laughs> and this is the thing, right? Is that is that while the number of protons really defines that element, if we have yes. 12 protons, we're looking at carbon. But we can have different amounts of neutrons. So how, how do you get these different flavors, these different isotopes? You add or subtract neutrons. But how? <laughs> 
Well, <laughs> it's well <laughs> when a mommy and daddy proton get together. <laughs> no, seriously though, it's it's one of these things where you can get to them through a whole variety of different ways. Uh, you can get to them um, in the outskirts of a star by having. Um, neutrons slowly bombarding atomic nuclei in the atmospheres of stars and you build up, you can get various isotopes of carbon that way for instance. Uh, during supernovae reactions you can have the fast process or the slow process taking, taking place. So that's the more positive direction to, to go. Um, on, on the more negative way to go you can have uh, nuclear today decay processes, either what's called an alpha process where um, you have a happy little atom sitting there and all of a sudden it, well for lack of a better word, excretes a helium atom. So off flies uh, two protons and two neutrons that are tied together via the uh, strong force, they go flying away, um, bye bye alpha particle, hello new isotope that is actually a completely different atom because you got rid of two protons. Uh, we also have beta decay processes where either a proton spontaneously turns into an, uh, a neutron and a positron or you have uh, a neutron spontaneously turns into a proton and an electron um, and there's other things like neutrinos involved. But all these different processes change the identity of an atom in various ways. But you said like in the, in the outsides of stars, in supernova, I mean are the methods of creating the different flavors of say carbon fairly extreme places? I mean, are you just going to get, say, a carbon atom get, I don't know, like get hit by a piece of hydrogen and then turn into carbon-14? Or is it, do you need like really powerful extreme events to happen? It, it depends on which direction you're going. If you're building things up, yes, that's going to be some sort of something is in an extreme environment. You need some sort of a neutron stream uh, that is hammering away slowly but surely producing that neutron flow that the, the nuclei is able to get bombarded and over time build up, build up, build up. Uh, but the decay process can happen anywhere. So we have here on Earth carbon-14. Um, it's a radioactive form of carbon and plants absorb it. So throughout their life they're going to absorb carbon-14 and the stable forms of, of carbon-12 and 13 um, in, in particular ratios. And once the plant dies it's clearly no longer processing carbon out of the atmosphere because it's dead. Um, so that dead plant will then perhaps turn into charcoal through a fire. It will perhaps uh, simply become, well, a fossilized piece of wood. Uh, and as you look at its ratio over time, we can do carbon dating. Carbon dating also works on, well, we're eating those plants. So we're by consuming plants, we're consuming that ratio of carbon, 12, 13 to 14. And so when you do radiocarbon iso radio carbon dating, you're looking at the ratios of the isotopes that basically go back to the plants we ate, the plants we used to make our clothes, the plants we used to make our fire. Um, if there is a plant involved, we can carbon date it. Right, I see. So you've got these plants. There's a the atmosphere has a certain ratio of carbon fourteen to carbon twelve to carbon thirteen, and they're they're breathing it in. Yes. The carbon dioxide. They're turning it into plant material, and they're incorporating that carbon fourteen into their structure. It works exactly the same. Like they can use a carbon fourteen just like they can yeah, use a carbon twelve. Yeah. Chemically, chemically, you as as far as as chemical reactions are concerned. A carbon is a carbon is a carbon doesn't really matter for all intents and purposes. Um, doesn't really matter which isotope it is. And so when we're digesting things, when we're weaving things, when we're burning things, 
all carbon is treated the same. But then over the eons, well, the carbon-14 is going to decay, so that ratio is going to change over time. And by looking to see how the ratio has changed, we can figure out how old something is. But aren't there forms... So, I mean, you said that we can use carbon just in any shape or form. Mm -hmm. You know, I could eat a hamburger made of all carbon-14, and it would taste exactly the same as a carbon-12 yes. hamburger. But I know that, for example, hydrogen fusion wants deuterium, right? And that's a, and that's a not a hydrogen. chemical process. So ah. this is where we have to look. So chemistry, that's the electromagnetic force. That's what bonds my coffee cup happily together with... with I think it's mostly ionic bonds, but don't trust me on that. I'm a physicist, not a chemist. Um, so as, as far as covalent bonds, ionic bonds, your general chemical reactions care. It, it's all about the atomic number. It's all about the number of electrons. For chemistry, the number of electrons does matter. Um, that's the ion. Um, but when it comes to quantum mechanics, then you start to worry about, well, what's the neutron number? And in fact, one of the uh, things that I actually did as research in graduate school was the molecule magnesium hydride can be made up with uh, magnesium atoms that have different numbers of neutrons in them. And depending on what the magnesium hydride is made of, the color at which it absorbs light is going to be ever so slightly different because those protons in the center are repelling one another in slightly different ways, are attracting the electrons in slightly different ways that's all mediated by those neutrons being there. And so when we look at the light of stars, if we have a high enough resolution spectrograph, if we're able to split the light apart with fine enough details, we can actually start to see how the photons interact differently with each of those different types of atoms, how the electrons are thus in slightly different orbitals as a reaction. And the same is true with nuclear reactions. If you have an atom that has a different uh, binding energy to the core, it's that binding energy that plays such a big role in nuclear reactions. Well, if, if something's just on the verge of falling apart because it either has too few neutrons or too many neutrons, well, something that's about ready to fall apart anyways is, is going to be much easier to use in a nuclear reaction. This is where we start to worry about uh, countries that are enriching uranium. Well, enriching uranium generally means you're bombarding that sucker with more and more neutrons. Um, getting it to a higher and higher ratio of the, uh, well, easier to use in nuclear bombs, nuclear burning. Um, so we worry about neutron number. And as I said, it can worry, it can be a worry in both directions. Um, if, if you have too few, it's ready to fall apart in one direction. If you have too many, it's ready to fall apart in another direction. Is there a limit? Like if I, say, I took my hamburger and bombarded it with neutrons, <laughs> Um, and made a high <laughs> neutron burger. Um, you know, would there be some kind of limit on how many, how many neutrons a carbon atom can hold until it yes. just goes? Yeah, kaboom. and 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 in this case, uh, what you're more looking at is. Um, what is the rate of the two reactions? What is the rate at which you're bombarding that sucker with neutrons compared to the rate at which it's capable of uh, essentially switching identities? So as you're bombarding that poor, innocent, undeserving hamburger with neutrons, how quickly are those neutrons able to undergo beta decay to become protons and become something else entirely different. Um, if your rate of bombardment is slower than the reaction rate, it's just going to switch identities and become something stable. Now, if you're able to bombard those carbon atoms so fast that they're not able to undergo beta decay, you're going to end up with these very unwieldy carbon atoms. But the reality is, um, those unwieldy carbon atoms are going to quite happily undergo different decay processes, and you probably can't bombard it that quickly. But this does get at um, what are stable versus unstable isotopes, and the magical way it sometimes feels like uh, 
nuclear physicists are constantly pushing the boundaries of the periodic table, constantly trying to create heavier and heavier atoms. And what they're doing in most cases is bombarding things with neutrons to, um, well, get them to eventually undergo this beta decay to, to create the heavier atoms because, uh, well, in some cases that's a lot easier than bombarding with protons and trying to get the protons to stick. Both processes get used. Yeah, in preparing for this episode, I saw uh, there was a number that there was three, I think 3,000 artificial isotopes had been had been created. There, There's a poster. Above and beyond just the natural isotopes that we'll have in, in the universe, right? There, there's a poster that you can see in the background of one of the hallways in the Big Bang Theory that, that's a poster we actually had in graduate school and I deeply regret that I've never bought this poster and I just tried to find it online prepping for this show and couldn't. And it's this, this poster that when you look at it there's a diagonal line and that's the line of stable atoms. Um, not stable atoms, stable nucleotides, stable isotopes. And off of it is is different colors that represent different forms of unstable. So there's there's things that are stable for short periods, things that are stable for long periods, things that's that decay via beta process either through proton creation or uh, through neutron creation, and uh, things that decay via the alpha process by spitting out helium atoms. Um, this poster, when you get really close to it, allows you to look and see, oh, this is thorium of this species. It's going to bounce down here to a cedium, go back up to a different form of thorium, and you can trace through all of the different forms of decay processes that it goes through. And it's actually really neat to see how things linger at one state before finally decaying all the way down to, well, their end stable atom or atom. You atoms. kind of imagine, I imagine this like a cliff with different little, uh, you know, things jutting out of the cliff, little cliffs, uh, sub-cliffs, and these things are falling down and they, they're rolling and then they fall again and they roll for a bit and then you know, as they move through this process. Well, what, what's kind of awesome is the way they, they go up and down. So, so the particular reaction I'm thinking of is you have thorium-232 that will give off a helium nuclei, nuclei. So ditches two protons and two neutrons, becomes radium. Uh, 228, it then uh, goes through an inverse beta decay process, so then one of its neutrons becomes a proton, it's now a cetium, which I know I've never in my life pronounced completely right, uh, it then goes and switches another neutron to a proton, goes back up to thorium, now it's thorium-228, to, to now it bounces down to radium again, then francium, then radon eventually it gets all the way down to an unstable form of lead. And I just love the idea that this metal we rely on isn't always stable. So it becomes lead 212. It, it then undergoes another inverse beta decay, bounces up to bismuth, uh, goes through another inverse beta decay, goes up to polonium. And, and so you have things that are going up and down in proton number. So in terms of how um, big an atom they are in the way that we think of atoms when we're taking chemistry in 10th grade. You have things that go up the cliff, but they're also losing neutrons. So it's it's this crazy, how do you judge whether something's bigger or smaller? Well, you have to look at that combined neutron plus proton number. Right, so you add up the protons and the neutrons, mm -hmm. and because each time that it's doing some kind of decay, it's it's shooting off neutrons away from the atom itself, right? They're gone. Well, it's, it's either shooting off a neutron or sh shooting off is the wrong word. So, um, Emitting? Uh, no, no. So it will sometimes shoot off an alpha particle, which is two protons and two neutrons. But the rest of the time, it's shooting off either an electron or a positron as it converts a proton to a neutron or a neutron to a proton. So what we have is this, this case of protons and neutrons having essentially the same mass but a difference in charge. So you have to conserve charge which is either an electron or a proton goes away, you have to conserve other things so there's neutrinos involved, but 
as things bounce back and forth, the the radium-228, the acetium-228, the thorium-228, all three of those things are different atoms. You get between them by converting neutrons to protons. They have the same atomic number, but they're completely different atoms. So I'm just going to have to take your word for it here that I'm sure the math every time, every step, that if you add up all the positrons and take away all the electrons and convert the neutrons into protons and the protons into neutrons, that it all and, and balances out. the binding out. energy of the atom. Right. And so, the alpha so, particles come away. That, that in the end, each step, the math balances out again. And, and it is a matter of you have to... You have to conserve charge. You have to conserve a bunch of other stuff you learn about in quantum mechanics. You have to figure out, okay, so the atomic nuclei has a certain binding energy. What happens to that energy? But in the end, for the most part, everything is conserved. There's a few exceptions that you learn about in advanced quantum mechanics that if they didn't exist, our universe wouldn't exist. So we're grateful for the exceptions and annoyed by them. Uh, but it, it's really a fascinating process to learn about. And the amazing thing is how much of this we can calculate, how much of this we can predict. And so there's, there's this great pairing of once we started to figure it out, people could go on mad predictions of, OK, there should be stability right here. Spin up the, the linear accelerator, spin up the neutron stream. Um, and build away. And so right now, I mean, is the limit of like the isotopes that we can build purely the amount of energy that we can, the, the, the amount of neutrons that we can slam in? Because I, I can imagine you've got the situation where you're, you're slamming neutrons into your atom to try and build it up, but then it's trying to decay off neutrons faster and faster. And it's just like how fast and how much energy can you throw at this problem? It, right? it, it ends up becoming, it's, so depending on if you're building things up by, by using a proton stream or a neutron stream, um, it, it really becomes a matter of how fast, how dense can you get it so that you can overcome the desire of the protons to repel, the uh, rate at which the neutrons are trying to decay. There's um, all of these different things. It becomes a rate bounded problem. Right. Is there, do you think there's any limit? Do you think there's some point where you just can't make a heavier atom and things will just start bouncing off? This is one of those things that, that theorists struggle with. You periodically see papers in the literature that it's thought that if we can just get big enough, we're going to hit another stable point. But when you look out across the universe, well, our universe does a pretty good job at creating all sorts of accelerators. Um, we don't see any evidence that, that there's uh, atomic lines in stellar spectra or any other type of spectra, for that matter, that those atoms actually exist. Um, so I, I, I am dubious about mm -hmm. there being another plateau of stable atoms, but I suspect that we can build larger and larger atoms as technology gets better and better. The suckers are just going to decay so fast that there's always going to be the, did you catch it? Okay, caught it. Um, and, and so yes, we'll probably be able to keep building things bigger that last for bazillions of a second before decaying away. Um, it sort of starts to become um, the nuclear physicist's challenge of, look what I did. And right. it's kind of an awesome challenge. Uh, yeah, it's it's really expensive and fun. <laughs> right. you got to build bigger and bigger particle accelerators <laughs> to get your, yeah. your... But I just imagine, you know, someone might ha get enough energy, hammer together, and like, pop, you've got something that's got, you know, 400 quadrillion protons just one big one big atom you can like pick it up and hold it and you're like yeah it's one atom it's the, the 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 issue starts to become the the strong force works over a very small distance and the electromagnetic force which is forcing those protons to try and fling each other apart it doesn't care it happily works over any distance so when your atomic nuclei 
gets bigger than what the strong force can act over, um, it just wants to fall apart. And, and so there are limits based strictly on the fact that while the strong force over short distances is strong enough to hold nuclei together, it only works over very short distances. Now we talked a bit about isotopes and how they're used for radioactive carbon dating where we look at the ratios of carbon-14 to carbon-13, carbon-12. What are some other uses specifically in astronomy that, that astronomers will use these different isotopes as a, as a research tool? Well, it, it's not just carbon that we use for dating. There, there's an entire field of uh, cosmochemistry where we use the different isotopes to understand, well, how old is the gas in the outskirts of that star? Because, well, um, these different nucleotides, they're, they're formed in supernovae. The supernovae then, uh, the material from the supernovae then get gravitationally swept up and turned into new stars. And so you can start to date, well, what is the, the limit on the age of this, this star's composition? Um, and that starts to give us a sense of how long the stars have been around. Uh, we can use it for dating uh, likely when our solar system formed by looking at the ratios of isotopes in, in different uh, asteroid fragments. Um, and, and then there's just basically the fact that well, stars wouldn't burn if it wasn't for tritium and deuterium, which burn much easier than your standard hydrogen does. So when we're trying to define what's the difference between a star and a planet, we're looking for, well, did the tritium get dense enough in the center? That's, that's a hydrogen atom that has multiple neutrons. Um, did it get hot enough that it would burn and you'd end up with nuclear burning. Well, in that case, this was a star, however short a period of time it burned. Um, and then the uses go on and on. Uh, different species of uranium and plutonium are easier to use in nuclear reactions. Uh, we use different uh, isotopes for uh, treating cancers. Uh, the uses go on and on. There's radium, nuclear radium, and fire detectors. That's really cool. I mean, I know that, for example, like, is it, was it, is it lead? Like astronomers are looking for lead in the atmospheres of stars to date stars. Yeah, yeah, right? that's one of the uses. Yeah, and so, so if we're looking for plants, we look at carbon, and if we're looking at the age of stars, we use lead, and there is a there is an isotope that we can use to date almost anything out there. It's just the, How you know, long which, is that sucker stable? Yeah, what's its half-life? How long do we want to do that? So I guess one last question. Mm -hmm. Is everything decaying down eventually to just one proton? Like, will every no. atom... No. So are no. things that are like there, they will hit their isotope and they're stable forever? As near as we can tell, there are a few dozen atoms that are just stable. So for instance... Uh, Helium is is it gloriously stable. Um, certain isotopes. Uh, so there there is a whole list of of atoms that, depending on whether or not protons decay, and this is one of those great debates right. we've talked about in many different episodes. If protons don't decay, or at least until the proton starts to decay, um, then yeah, those suckers are stable. And so you could imagine some future universe when the when everything in the universe is just made up of those yes. stable atoms. Yes. Wow. And and yeah, and then of course there's uh, neutron stars and things like that, which are completely different but are, are looked at as, as stable. So, so we have things like carbon-12 and 13 are stable, oxygen-16, 17, 18 is stable, potassium-39, 41. Uh, there's lots of different stable things out there. Right. Wow. That's really interesting. Cool. Well, I think that's great, Pamela. Thank you very much. My pleasure. All right. Stop that. <sighs> that's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. So we could just end up with like potassium, oxygen, carbon, and helium.
<laughs> there, there's actually 40 different things. Oh, okay, so 40 different stable ones. There, okay. There's like uh, scandium, titanium, there's a whole bunch of different ones. That's really cool. Um, okay. That is one of the things I get to add, the things I had no idea. <laughs> um, which are some of my favorite stuff. Okay. I'm just going to export and make sure we're safe. Upload to the Dropbox, and then we'll take some questions. Yeah, I have to figure out. I'm recording in my home office because it was so cold upstairs, I decided I'm not that brave a person. It, it sounds fine. It's all good. <laughs> you could record there, except for the dogs. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. So let's look at some questions here. Um, uh, Guido Bibras, that's all way too much chemistry for me. I got lost about ten minutes ago. Sorry, man. We can't <laughs> so can't sorry. all. Yeah, it can't all be. Uh, uh, you know, I'm trying to think. Uh, not chemistry. Uh, I love chemistry. Actually, my son loves chemistry. My son will watch chemistry videos on YouTube for hours. That's awesome. Yeah, crazy chemistry experiments. Yeah, he's really totally into it. He's totally going to be like a maker, builder type person. See, I like that type of chemistry. The problem is I'm dyslexic, so trying to read chemical reactions doesn't work so well. Uh, Andrew Planet suggests to add to that burger, my carbon-14 burger, some carbon-15 cheese and ketchup. I think that'll be good. I think the trick with this burger is to keep it right at the edge where you get, like, it's a little spicy. You can really kind of taste the tingle of it decaying in your mouth. I think that's that's what's going to be the future of culinary uh, uh, experiments. So if anyone wants to make a, a carbon-14, I don't want to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to go anywhere near it without, like, lead. So, all right. Uh, all right, let's get some more questions here. Um... Uh, Hugo Burnham asks, where does the neutron go when it leaves the nucleus through the decay process? So I kind of asked that question, but but like, what happens to those neutrons? Do so so you have two different processes. With alpha decay, it produces a, a helium nucleus that just flies off. That's alpha decay. And um, much to my confusion for many years, an alpha particle is nothing more than a helium nucleus. I consider it a harsh, cruel thing that they did, naming alpha particles alpha particles instead of just calling them a helium nucleus. But when they named them, they didn't know that. Um, so with alpha particles, you, you produce a helium nucleus that flies away at high energies um, and is actually quite dangerous when it hits you in large numbers. Um, in beta decay, you have either a proton switches identity and becomes a neutron and gives off a elect uh, sorry proton uh, becomes a neutron that gives off a positron which is an anti-electron and that anti-electron just goes flying away enters the rest of reality um, or you have a neutron that becomes a proton and then an electron goes flying away. Right, okay. So you don't just get these neutrons just zipping away. No. You've got, yeah, more complicated process. Okay. Uh, so David uh, Kaczynski asks a completely different question about Comet Ison. So if our, uh, if our knowledge of Ison's composition is not good enough to make a confident projection on whether it will survive its swing by the sun, how can astronomers know that Ison will not lose the exact necessary amount of mass or change direction due to the mass loss such that it would impact the Earth later this year? Oh, uh, okay. So, so that's a um, many-layered question. So, yeah. composition doesn't really matter here. Composition, uh, that that's what amount of it is carbon dioxide, what amount of it is oxygen, what amount of it is um, any other of the different gassy things, the organic sludge that makes up a comet. We never really know what any comets are made of in terms of ratio. It's like looking at the crust of bread and guessing what the ratio of different ingredients is just by looking at the crust of a loaf of bread. Um, but when we, we look at comets, we know that 
uh, their orbits are going to change periodically based on they might end up with a pocket on one side that gives off a jet of, of gas. And that will cause their orbits to vary over time. But there is a limit to which that can happen. So you have large chunk of mass that's on an orbit. And you can place limits on what is the maximum amount that we've seen jets move something before and what is the minimum amount. So minimum amount is you assume no change in orbit whatsoever, its current orbit is the same. Maximum amount is essentially the error bars on that orbit. So assuming all the different places that you could have jets, how much is its orbit going to vary? When we look at that we realize it doesn't have enough stuff for its orbit to get changed enough for it to hit us. It just it can't get there from here. Or rather it can't get here from there. So yeah, we're and completely safe no matter what. Yeah, and I think people need to understand just how far away this comet is going to get. It is going to get really far away from us. Like it yeah. will never get close. Let me yeah. I, I've got this great simulator of comet ice in here and I'm just going to show you here. So so this is you find this at the solar system scope um, and you can so let's see. So let's just run this. So that's okay. I'll go back here. Um, that okay. Is so beautiful. Isn't this great? Yeah. And then I can zoom in, right? So here we are uh, now, right about there. We're just about to do perihelion. So we're just days away from it doing perihelion, and we don't know if it's going to survive. But then it comes around. And looks like it's going right past Earth, right? This is sort of it. But let's yeah, just, you but know, let's it's like that's the orbit of Venus. Look at this. Look how. Okay, so here's there. So you see how this is? And we'll just keep watching. Boom, away it goes. Right. So it never, ever gets close to us. Yeah, no. Not ever. So, so I mean, it would have to be uh, just an incredibly powerful rocket on it to move it in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, and so, we're, we're safe no matter what. And honestly, I'm on the side of that sucker's falling apart. I, I'm on the opposite side. Really? That sucker's staying together. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know why? Because I really want a bright comet. <laughs> That's why. Right? Because what was the last uh, one that we had? Hayakataki? Hayak yeah, right? Hayakataki. And so that was like 98, 99. I mean, we are due. It is time. Time for new bright comets. I, I I agree. I've just been watching how much it's been brightening so far, and yeah, I'm worried for its stability. Comets, ice is gonna do just fine. It'll be just fine. It's all right. <laughs> Buck up. Um, it's gonna be great. So so that's it. So I mean, the point is is that so Dave, it's a great question. Comets have a set amount of change that they can make depending on the and I mean it's great right because you get these jets that yeah, come off in and funny we do ways misplace and they place them yeah and they and the jet will a, a jet will appear on the side of the comet and spray out material and it acts like a little rocket that will push the comet in in a different direction that was expected but but not anything significant right so uh, that's just uh, that's great uh, let me see if there's any more questions here um and and I, I'm looking at Twitter and and Danielle Gonzalez, I adore you. He he wrote that he donated money to CosmoQuest because Star Strider says it's all she wants for Christmas and it is. So donate to CosmoQuest at cosmoquest.org slash donate and, and you'll make my Christmas wishes come true. Oh, okay. Um oh uh Sylvan Westby notes that in an hour and 15 minutes the SpaceX uh, Falcon 9 will be launched from Cape Canaveral to a GUC. There have been so many uh, rocket launches in the past week. There were 60 satellites launched last week. Because <laughs> <laughs> there was two collections of microsats. So Dang. Yeah, it was crazy. It was a gigantic record. It was, there was like 29 and then the record was beaten again with even more. So, yeah, it was it was madness last week. Um, and, but SpaceX is great. So did I tell you that I got a chance to go out to SpaceX and see the facility? No, that's yeah. great. Yeah, when I was down in LA, uh, someone from SpaceX invited me to go and, and take a look and uh, it's the best. It is the best place. It is like 
and it's like Disneyland for space nerds. Because <laughs> <laughs> just the way they build them, like it's all out in the open, so like you just walk yeah. past and you see them putting together these uh, the, the Merlin engines, and and the other great thing is everyone's walking around, and they're like, we're going to Mars. There's yeah. no question in their mind that, yeah. that the plan is we're going to Mars. It's just it's a great place. Um, all right. Let's see if I've got any more questions here. Uh, hmm. um, no, I think I got all the questions. Anyone has another question for me? Uh, so what's coming up then? So we've got some learning space this week? Um, I'm actually not sure. So here in the United States, this is Thanksgiving week. And uh, so Thanksgiving is Thursday, which means my primary goal for this week is uh, this is the week I end up doing all of my financing to figure out uh, what still gets to survive after January 1. So yes, please donate, people. We need your funding to keep things going. Um, but uh, I think there's going to be a whole lot of the team at CosmoQuest eating far too much food this week. Um, I'm actually going to have a lot of the team over Friday um, because we live in the middle of the country and not everyone's going home for Christmas. We spend our money doing science rather than buying airplane tickets to see our families. We're horrible humans and wonderful humans simultaneously. <laughs> right. um, so yeah, I think the plan is to run budgets and eat food this week. That sounds like fun. Half fun. Um, half fun, half budgets. Uh, yeah, well, we've already had our Thanksgiving, so. Yeah. No, spoiler alert, it was delicious. Yeah, well, we are going to go see Doctor Who this evening. Well, so. let, me know what you, let me know what you think. I can't wait to talk to you about it because okay. it brought up a lot of ideas and, and I had a lot of opinions, so I would love to hear your <laughs> thought. Awesome. Cool. Okay, well, thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, thank you, Pamela, again for making it back alive from Indonesia, ready to continue this mad schedule. And I hope you have a great Thanksgiving. And really, Thanksgiving, Thursday, is really happy ice and perihelion day. So that's, yeah. I think that's the that's the new holiday for us. I'm, I'm wishing everyone clear skies. It's like horribly gross here. And I have a brand new tracking tripod that I desperately want to, to use. And, oh, if we get a clear sky, I will be dragging my sorry self out. To, to go do astrophotography. It's, it's pointless right now because it's behind the sun, so you got to wait right. a couple more days before no, it goes on the other side. So, uh, cool. Man, I can't believe we're just days away. This is so great. Okay, all right. Well, I will see all of you later. We're probably doing a space hangout on Friday, maybe, depending on if people's just too bloated from their turkey, but <laughs> we'll figure that out. Um, okay. Okay, cool. All right. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, everyone, okay. for watching, and we'll see you all next week.